Hi everyone, how are we doing? Uh, my name is Amanda Milberg. I'm a senior partner solutions engineer here at DataIQ. And today I'm gonna talk about how you can have your cake and eat it too with DataIQ and Databricks. So before we start, by show of hands, who here has heard of a cronut? Cool. So for those that haven't, this is a cronut. It was invented in 2013, ironically the same time as DataIQ, but that's not really the purpose of this analogy. At, in Soho, New York at Dominique Ansel Bakery. And what this did was it simply just combined two great products, the croissant and the donut. And after its inception, it was a total hit. Lines were crazy, over 300 people lining up each day to get a cronut. And eventually, with the lines getting so rowdy that a bouncer had to be outside the bakery in Soho, just to make sure everyone was doing okay. But the reason why I'm explaining what a cronut is today is really just to show the power of one plus one equals three. How two great products existed on their own, a croissant and a donut. But when you mix them together, truly magic happens. And so we're gonna use this analogy as we walk through today, how DataIQ and Databricks is a winning formula for data excellence. And we're gonna walk through this presentation in three sections. We're gonna start by gathering the ingredients, simply providing an overview of what is DataIQ and how it works with Databricks. Then we're gonna follow a recipe, going through a practical example of how we can train or customize a large language model in DataIQ using the compute and storage power of Databricks. And finally, we're gonna put that icing on the cake. We're gonna show how we can democratize our LLM to the enterprise, truly achieving that last mile AI, but we're gonna talk about how we can do so in a secure and governed way, following DataIQ's Raft framework. So, without further ado, let's get started. So if you can remember one thing, or if I can boil DataIQ down into one sentence, DataIQ is a platform for all people, all data, and any analytic technique. Essentially, we're an analytics workbench that sits on top of your infrastructure. We work with all people, since we're a collaborative platform that unites all users on one interface, from low code to no code to high code users. We work with all data, as we can connect to multiple data sources and also deploy on-prem in a dedicated cloud, or we also have our own SaaS solution. And we work for any analytic technique because we cover end-to-end -end or the full analytic life cycle from data access and cataloging to prep and analysis to machine learning and product deployment. And today, I'm gonna to talk about LLMs because I mean, how could we not? But I want you to think of other analytical techniques you can use with a collaborative platform such as DataIQ. So great, we know what DataIQ is, but we're at a Databricks conference, so how do we work together? Well, as I mentioned before, DataIQ is an analytics workbench that sits on top of your existing infrastructure. So if that existing infrastructure is Databricks, you have the power to not only connect to your lake house, but push all computation down to Databricks. So think of us as the UI, and then you have Databricks under the hood, right? Cool. Well, the proof is in the pudding, so let's talk about the feature integrations that we have in order to make this integration possible. All right, what you see on the screen is what we call the DataIQ flow. It's a visual transformation of how data is moving and transforming from left to right. But for all maybe the nerds in the room, this is nothing more than JSON wrappers around SQL and Python code pointing to Lakehouse data. And I'll show a little bit more about how this works today. But what I want you to understand is that in blue, we have what we call data sets. In this case, we're reading and writing directly from Lakehouse. This means that we work with Unity Catalog, we inherit security permissions, everything from Lakehouse data. We also have yellow circles. That's visual recipes. When I say visual recipes, this is really more for potentially our low code or no code users. It's a GUI guided interface to help with data preparation. The coolest part is that all of the preparation steps that you define in the visual recipes are still pushed down with computation happening in Databricks. Prefer to code? 
Awesome. We also have code recipes. That's what you see in orange. Whether you're a, Cy a SQL coder or a Python coder, we also execute down in Databricks. SQL via the JDBC driver and Python via the newly announced Databricks Connect v2. We also have this concept of visual machine learning. This means that you can create a visual machine learning model in Data IQ and score inference new data in a batch way in Databricks. We also integrate with MLflow, which means if you prefer to train uh, models in Databricks, that's great, that's awesome. We can pull that model down from the model registry, turn it into a saved model in Data IQ for native oper operationalization and scoring. Or if you prefer to train a model in Data IQ, we can export that MLflow stream, register it with Databricks, and do model serving in Databricks. Awesome. So now that we've highlighted those feature integrations, I want you to keep that in mind as we walk through our practical example today. So maybe you've seen something at this conference of what large language models are, but I just wanted to level set the conversation. Large language models are a subset of foundational models that are trained specifically on text sources. And they're truly revolutionary because for the first time, these machines have the ability to generate human language. They can understand context, intent. They can get creative, and that's super powerful. And all I have to say is the hype is real. An Accenture report on Gen AI showed that 62% of total times employee work employees work are made up of language tasks. And 65% of those tasks have the power to be automated or augmented through LLMs. So this is all to say that it's good that you're here, it's good that you're learning because this is truly a revolutionary technique. But when we talk about that technique, we often see these two broad categories emerge. On one hand, you have proprietary SaaS large language models, something like an OpenAI, an Azure OpenAI, a Cohere, et cetera. And these are super performant. They're large models, they're primarily accessed through an API, and they're great for what they do. I'm sure you all have played around with the chat GPT on the browser interface. But from a security perspective, data is leaving your environment. And for some organizations, it stops there. On the other hand, you have the category of open source models. These are smaller and maybe could be less performant according to benchmarks, but the data can stay in your environment and it is fully customizable. We're talking about things like transformer models on Hugging Face, Mosaic, MPT7B, Dolly, et cetera. And there really is no right and wrong on which one is better because performance is arbitrary. And I'll use an example. Let's say you're responding to customer support cases and you want to do so in a haiku way in Shakespearean prose. Then sure, OpenAI will probably work great for you. But in reality, you have 10,000 historical support cases that you want to use to customize an LLM to generate language that your customers are used to and understand. And in that case, an open source LLM might work for you. But regardless, let's walk through an example to see this in practice. So today, we have an illustrative customer called Bloombot. As the development team, we were tasked to develop a question and answering system powered by a large language model to assist the support desk in responding to questions from customers. And as we scope out this MVP, we are talked to by our three key stakeholders. First, VP of Customer Ops. They request that our LLM is customized on our internal Q&A knowledge source from support tickets in the past. We have all this data, why don't we use it so our LLM understands the context of our customers? Second, we have the head of risk, super excited by this innovation, but wants to balance speed with caution. She insists that our data does not leave our environment. And third, we have the director of IT, concerned with cost, and cost in all forms, from API costs, to new infrastructure costs, to GPU compute costs. They just wanna make sure as we begin to do this, we do so on a smaller local model as a proof of concept. So now we've spoken to our stakeholders and it's time to start developing our flow in Data IQ. So now we're on our mission to customize an open source LLM model fully contained on our company's infrastructure with no external data movement. So we go to Data IQ and we're once again presented with the flow. And I'll reiterate what I spoke to about before. You can see our data is stored in Lakehouse. So we're reading and writing data from Lakehouse. 
security, governance, read and write permissions prevail through to Data IQ. We have a combination of both visual and code recipes. Computation will be pushed down to Databricks. Now I'll walk through in a little bit more detail the three aspects of this flow. First, we're going to prepare our data. Data IQ makes it really helpful to turn unstructured data into structured data, and I'll show you a little bit about that and how we can push that computation down to Databricks. Second, we're build what we call a vector store. This allows us to ask similar our vector store of similar answers from the past and pass relevant facts to our LLM. A great technique to customize an LLM without fine tuning. And when I say fine tuning, I'm saying changing the underlying parameters of a model. And then third, we'll actually go and query our LLM. We'll instantiate our prompt template, pass this query to Dolly, our LLM of choice that works for us based on our stakeholders, and we'll generate a response. What I'll say here is that I'm gonna show some screen grabs in this demo because doing a live demo is crazy, but if you wanna talk more, we'll be at booth 423 and I'm happy to walk through this entire process. Cool, so let's prepare our data. So, we start with an XML file. We drop it into Data IQ and Data IQ can automatically parse the structure of this XML file into a structured format. Cool, beautiful soup, that's also fun, but look how cool it is when I can just drag and drop and leverage Data IQ to quickly turn my unstructured data into structured data. Now, this is only step one. I need to prepare my data in a way that makes sense for my vector store. And for that, I'll use a prepare recipe as well as some other visual recipes. And what I want you to take away from this is Data IQ's visual guided interface. I can add prepare steps to the left, in my case, cleaning text, but I also have over 100 different processors that I can access. Now, for example, I move to my join recipe. I outline my join keys and I can view the underlying query, JSON wrapper, SQL under the hood, like I said, so I can see very transparently the SQL query that I'm creating via this visual recipe and how that execution is happening on Databricks. Awesome, but as I said before, Data IQ is a platform for all users. So I just addressed a little bit of the low code visual recipes but let's also talk about code recipes. Building out our vector store, we want to use the latest and greatest open source technology, in our case, Langchain. We can define our Python code environment and also edit this code recipe in a notebook or your IDE of choice via what we call code studios, allowing you to iterate in Data IQ via our code recipes while also combining these code recipes with visual recipes to build an end-to-end -end pipeline. At the end of the day, creating an LLM is a holistic approach that involves data preparation, building this vector store, querying this LLM, and then deploying it. And so these steps are showing you how there's more on the left and right than actually just training or customizing the LLM. But let's talk a little bit deeper about what this vector store does. So I call this vector store our secret ingredient. It's our retrieve then read pipeline. It's our proposed approach for customization without the need of fine tuning. Essentially, we receive a question from a user. We then query our vector store, which has our embedded text of relevant questions asked in the past. We receive those facts most semantically similar, it's a similarity search to that question. We then use those facts in our prompt, and then we pass this prompt to our LLM to query it and receive the answer. So you just see here an example of asking a question of does data IQ, can it be used for NLP? And we receive relevant facts from our internal documentation. But let's remember Bloombot. And how does it work there? Well, we start by getting a question from the user. Can anyone recommend a grow lamp that I can use to grow my plants inside? I go and I query my vector store pass this question as a similarity search, see the questions that have been answered or the answers to this question that have been responded to in the past. I get my relevant facts. It tells me about these cool lights. It also tells me about easy to grow plants. And then I have my prompt template, which I already created before, that basically says use only the information in the following paragraphs, my relevant facts, to generate the response to these questions. I now have my relevant facts. I have my prompt, I instantiate that template together, I pass this off to Dolly, 
and I get my results. So Dolly now takes this relevant facts and it provides an example to me as the user saying that I've had success with a specific light and also jade plants are really nice to grow indoors. So a super cool way to customize an LLM without the need to fine tune. Low computational resources, data stays on our environment. This is also something that was said during the keynote, retrieval augmented search. Really cool stuff here. Great, so we have our LLM, but what do we do with it now? We need to democratize this, put this in the hands of the business users. Because it's really cool if we have an LLM, but it's really cooler when our employees can actually use this LLM. And so, we can do that through what we call data IQ applications. It's a no-code way to put a front-end application on top of your existing flow. In the case here, I create an application instance. Then I'm able to ask single questions or upload a batch of questions. I run what we call a data IQ scenario, which just simply provides the inference to Dolly. And then I'm able to view the answers on, let's say, a dashboard or download those answers as a CSV file to potentially move downstream. The best part here is that it allows for rapid prototyping and rapid development. There's no need to bring in IT. We can host instances on DataIQ itself. And if you prefer to code, that's awesome. We have concepts called web apps, which allows you to code in your Python, uh, sorry, your front end language of your choice, but a really nice way to just fast prototype as you're trying to get that MP MVP out as fast as possible. But with democratization comes governance, and it's important. And for that, last week, Data IQ released the Raft framework for generative AI. We want to ensure that when you're deploying these large language models, you're doing so with proper governance. And we break this down into four different sections reliability and safety, the R accountability and govern, fair and human-centric, and transparent and explainable. And I'm happy to dive deeper into this RAF framework at the booth at the conclusion of this talk. But with that, I'll recap what we learned in this session. A journey from ingredients to insights. One, we described how Data IQ provides the most comprehensive platform for all your people, all your data, and any analytic technique. Two, we discussed how we can customize an open source LLM in Data IQ using the compute and storage power of Databricks. And three, we demonstrated how we can democratize our LLM to the enterprise in a safe, secure, and governed way. And maybe you learned this, maybe in the 12.30 lunch stop, you stopped talking when I said cronut, but it doesn't matter because all I want you to remember is one plus one equals three. Mixing these two technologies together can truly um, achieve data excellence. And with that, I'll leave you to it. Thank you very much for joining today, and I have a nice day. <laughs>